thanks very much. Um, I'd like to start also by congratulating you on this report and for, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Um, it's really just another sign of IFPRI's thought leadership in the aftermath of the food price crisis and um, you know it's con continuous um, drumbeat on this issue. So um, congratulations. The report is really terrific. It, look, it takes a very comprehensive view um, at food and nutrition security. It captures all the major global, regional, and national processes that affect global food security. And it's a reminder, really, of how interconnected um, the world is and um, the, the challenges and the opportunities are. Um, I, I really appreciate the focus on climate change, the biofuels, and the impact of trade policies. The report also did a terrific job of capturing the political momentum around nutrition last year. And as Schengen um, did, <coughs> recognized uh, the really important contribution that IFPRI's researchers have made to this debate, um, both in the 2008 and 2013 Lancet series, um, the conference that was held in Delhi in 2011 on agriculture and nutrition, and the really good work that CGIAR is doing on agriculture and nutrition for, and agriculture, nutrition, and health. For me, the most exciting part about this um, report is that it raises the level of ambition. I think the focus on um, I, I'll disagree a little bit with Homi. <laughs> the focus on um, 2025, despite the fact that the world is definitely coalescing around 2030, definitely um, raises the bar. And I think the, the case studies in the report um, really show that it is possible, and very concretely, and um, lay, lay out in very clear terms uh, the pieces that have, have to come into play. And those are very tangible. Um, we are, you know, two years, one and a half years off from the MDGs, and we will miss the hunger goal just by a little bit. And given that we've just come out of the food price crisis, or sort of we're, we're in the food price volatility um, era, it is striking to me that we will just miss that goal by a very small margin. And in fact, additional effort this year and next year may actually have a huge impact. So I think um, you know look, this report and the case studies focus help focus in on um, the MDGs, but also looking ahead. Um, the the stunting target um, that you lay out is also hugely ambitious. It's more ambitious than the World Health Assembly um, target of, of reduction of 40% by 2025. Um, and you know, from an advocacy perspective, I think um, it, we should accept the challenge and um, and really help help this this report can really help open up the discussion of what needs to happen. Um, I'd like to focus my remarks a little bit up on the nutrition side of it because I think that was that is the new part of the the um, story connecting the dots between agriculture and nutrition. Um, in 2012, the World Health Assembly, for the very first time, adopted nutrition targets. That was a, a huge shift. Um, there were 12, uh, the six targets that were um, adopted, and stunting is um, one of the main ones. Um, the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition also was launched in 2012. So leading into 2013, um, there was already a, a push. But 2013, as the report very rightly recognizes, really has added to the momentum, real commitments, both financial and um, policy commitments um, at Nutrition for Growth. The expansion of Sun, the expansion of um, the New Alliance countries. And uh, the, re the report also focuses on the role of the, pr the growing um, role of the private sector in, in this space. I'd like to add three additional points around things that happened in 2013 that I think will have a tremendous impact moving forward. One is the role of civil society. Um, last year, um, 
the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement's Civil Society Network got launched. Um, it is now a functioning network, and there are um, 29 civil society alliances in some countries. And so while, while civil society has been very active in, um, at the global level, pushing for um, the creation of the Sun Movement and being really part of that and, and pushing on the nutrition for growth, I think what's really exciting about um, the Sun Civil Society Network is what's the potential on the ground um, in, in Sun countries, both from an advocacy and accountability perspective, but also the role that they play in directly relating to the communities that are most affected by hunger and, and malnutrition. So that, I think, is an important um, dimension. And I think um, last year, the network had its first inaugural meeting. and. The main issue that really came out of that meeting was the importance of cross-learning across the network and um, the importance of capacity building. Um, civil society recognizes th their own capacity needs, and, um, and so that ties very much into other recommendations in the report. The other two uh, things I'd like to flag um, that I find, I find both significant events in 2013 in the nutrition space were around the renewed commitment on the thousand day partnership between the, um, the US and Ireland. I think this really, the thousand day partnership has really helped elevate nutrition and raise awareness about it. And it's exciting to see that continued leadership. And, and Jada will speak more about this, but I think the US government has also embarked on um, developing a, a, a nutrition strategy, a whole of government nutrition strategy, as well as a USAID nutrition strategy. The reason I think those are really important, um, not just for the US, but um, more broadly, is you know it, it's an example of how coordination across um, agencies, and I think um, this strategy will lead to better coordination, better guidance, um, measuring impact and building up the evidence base. And I think the example that um, the US government um, has set um, is a lesson to other governments and other donors about really getting um, the house in order. I mean, one of the good things about this report is it really shows how multi-sectoral um, nutrition is. And it's one of the reasons it's taken so long for nutrition to, to get its place is because nobody's really taken ownership of it. And I think a strategy across, agency, across agencies, across sectors is really a critical to, to that piece. And one of the conversations that's really come out of, um, of this work is how do we define nutrition sensitive activities and programming? And I think that's an important conversation to getting um, the policies right um, and to building the evidence base. Looking ahead to, the, uh, to this year and sort of the post-2015, the report's really good on making the case that we shouldn't be complacent, and I think that's really important on nutrition as well. Um, there's been this tremendous momentum and, and um, lots of awareness about nutrition, but um, it's not very evenly reflected in, in the documents that are leading up to the, the post-2015 negotiations. And you know that the Open Working Group recently released its um, focus areas for comment. And it was striking to me that there was absolutely no mention of stunting or any of the World Health Assembly targets around nutrition. So, so I think there's still work to be done, and, and we, we need to um, really push for a robust um, hunger and nutrition um, goal in the post-2015. And it's important not just to look at um, because of the multi-sectoral nature of nutrition, it's important not just to, to push for, for a hunger, food security, and nutrition goal, but to also sh demonstrate how nutrition can be affected by other sectors. So, um, you know, p looking at, looking for indicators that could be included in other areas um, as well, such as um, gender equality, um, 
ch child health and other, other issues like that. This year, the World Health Assembly will be taking a two-year stock take of, of its progress on the, on the World Health Assembly target, so that's an important um, moment. And then looking ahead to September, the UN General Assembly, and the, um, in Rome in November, a, a conference on, um, on nutrition, which will be really an important marker on the way to post, post the 2015 negotiation. Um, so just quickly, four areas that I think um, really need, um, that are in this report and really need attention as we look ahead to, to um, ending hunger and, and undernutrition by 2025. Capacity building. I, I mentioned it in the context of, of civil society, but I think, you know, what was really important uh, takeaway from all the case studies, from the four case studies, was the importance of an enabling environment, the importance of a you know policy framework, and um, and uh, platforms for delivery. I think those things, you know, initial starting conditions seem to be a really important piece. And in many countries, we're really at the beginning of that. And so, as we think about where to put resources, capacity building, institution building, all of those things become really important. Um, I already mentioned the importance of civil society, but, you know, I think as we think about the politics of keeping hunger and undernutrition on the agenda, civil society becomes a really important piece. So, so continuing to invest in civil society I, is key. And then women and girls. Women are at the nexus of agriculture and nutrition. They're both on the produc production side and the consumption side. They play a tremendous role in the care giving um, in the care aspects that are really important to ending hunger and undernutrition. Um, and they disproportionately ca carry the burden of um, that care. And so um, looking at how we can support their role in the, in the caregiving function while uh, facilitating you know, a a a economic empowerment is critical. Um, you know, sharing, sharing that burden across um, or easing that burden from women I think is critical. Um, and that's anything from, you know, um, infrastructure is key to that on, for water and energy needs and things like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, a theme that came, that Homi also mentioned, um, the data piece, and that's very much a part of the report. But I, I would underscore the need also for disaggregated data. It's not sufficient to look at what happens at the household level, but we need to look at what's happening to women and girls within the household and, um, and children under the age of five. I, so I'll stop there, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank <laughs> you.